recorded. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Rick Hooper. I'm president of Quasi, and welcome to a new cyber seminar series that we're having uh, this fall and spring. I just wanted to welcome everybody and to sort of announce our, our overall theme. Uh, Quasi, since its very beginning, the community has been very interested in observatories, and the National Science Foundation has started two major new programs. Uh, one is on critical zone observatories, uh, which is funded through the uh, Earth, Earth Sciences uh, Division of the Geosciences Directorate. And the second is the Water Sustainability and Climate Program, which is a cross-foundation program. And we're going to be hearing uh, both this fall and next spring from uh, a number of projects that are funded uh, through those two programs with the intent of trying to inform the commu community more broadly about these, uh, these individual projects. And, and I've asked the speakers all to address how the community can take advantage of these uh, facilities and, and these investments that NSF has been making in, uh, in these observatory programs. And that's particularly true for the Critical Zone Observatories, which is uh, uh, conceived to be a, a long-term program uh, with an investment that's being made in these, in these facilities. We've been really fortunate that we've had great, great uh, interest and cooperation from a number of the PIs on these projects. And our first talk today is by uh, Suzanne Anderson uh, from the University of Colorado. And I will let uh, then turn the the uh, mic over uh, to Todd Rasmussen at the University of Georgia, who's the um, who's, who's one of the directors on, on the quasi board of directors who's hosting uh, this year's uh, cyber seminars. Todd, thank you so much, Rick. This is Todd Rasmussen, as he said. I'm at the University of Georgia, and it was with great effort that I managed to stay here. We have the world's largest outdoor cocktail party going on down in. Jacksonville, Florida, the football game between uh, Georgia and Florida, but I think this holds um, is much more important than that in terms of the scientific community. But I'd like to welcome Suzanne Anderson today. She's uh, at the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder. Her background was uh, PhD in uh, geology and uh, geophysics at the University of California, Berkeley in 1995. And she's an associate professor, I believe. Are you now associate, Suzanne? I am now associate professor. <clears throat> Congratulations yes. at the university there. She was also, uh, she is also a research scientist at scientist at Instar, which is I just found out the. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, trying Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. So I'd like to uh, encourage everyone to mute their phones if they could. We get a lot of distracting background noise. Um, the other one would be that um, we will have to mute the phone for you if if we're picking up too much background noise. So at this point, uh, Suzanne, her talk is the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory. It's natural experiments to study critical zone evolution and function. Thank you, Todd, and thank you very much to um, Kwasi for giving us uh, me this opportunity to to speak with you as the first of the uh, Boulder Creek of the Critical Zone Observatories uh, presentations this year. Now, I have a couple goals today. Um, I'm going to introduce briefly <clears throat> the Critical Zone and CZOs themselves, and then I'm going to uh, walk through some of the work that we've been doing here at the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory where we're using these natural experiments um, and working at a couple different scales. Uh, I'll talk about landscape scale experiments over very long time periods um, and hill slope scale experiments where we're looking at more uh, quick time, current time processes. Um, I have a whole group of uh, collaborators uh, in this project, and so I just want to acknowledge them. We are a group of about, here in Boulder, of about 15 senior scientists, actually not just in Boulder, several other institutions as well. Um, over the years, we've had about 10 graduate students working with us, uh, three postdocs, and I currently have a, a staff of four um, technical staff working with us. And then there are many undergrads who've been involved in this work. So there are many people and hands involved in the project that I'm going to talk about today. 
Now, first of all, by way of introducing the critical zone, this, the critical zone was, was uh, defined in a National Research Council report, the Bros report, you may recall that, in 2001, as the Earth's surface, the place where water, rock, air, and life interact with each other. And understanding and studying the critical zone requires uh, interdisciplinary approaches. And this is a diagram from um, Sue Brantley illustrating uh, some of the challenges um, of advancing our understanding of the critical zone. It requires us uh, to integrate across uh, temporal and spatial scales. She attempts to illustrate that here with this sort of what she calls a flower diagram showing the kinds of measurements that we um, typically are, are making, ranging from very rapid processes in some places, somewhere I have an arrow, here it is. I make it go away. I've got to learn how to use my controls here. Okay. Um, so very rapid processes that would be atmospheric to very um, slow, uh, long time scale processes that uh, are changing the land surface. So this is the kind of scale of um, of temporal variability, and there's also spatial variability from things that are um, very small to things that are very large. So the National Science Foundation has funded six critical zone observatories since 2007. Um, they're all shown here on this map. Um, each uh, CZO has its own hypothesis, its own uh, research design. And yet, at the same time, we, we work together. We have um, our coordinating uh, website development. We have um, integrated data management that spans across the CZOs. And we meet, uh, at least the PIs and occasionally uh, members of these communities meet uh, regularly to discuss things. And we are beginning to have some cross-site activities as well. Uh, perhaps the, the most um, Significant of those cross-site activities is the acquisition of LIDAR data, which has been uh, completed. Um, Boulder, I want to point out here, um, we're right in the middle of the continent, right at the, on the um, Colorado Front Range and on the edge of the, the Great Plains. So now I'm going to turn to um, the Boulder Creek CZO and what we're working on. This, this um, states our... our uh, overarching hypothesis that erosion and weathering control the critical zone depth and the critical zone development across landscapes. Um, and that um, the history of erosion and weathering will be manifested in uh, the shape of the topography and the depth of the weathering um, environment that we find there. So we seek to understand the evolution of the critical zone on very long terms, looking at landscape uh, scale histories, and we also seek to identify the smaller scale processes that are operating and uh, what their controls are. So I'm going to start today by talking about the very largest scale, uh, spatial scale as well as temporal scale, and look at landscape scale natural experiments. Uh, that we could conduct. Um, and then I will, after going through that, I'll turn to the shorter time scale and the smaller spatial scale. And we'd like to take advantage of natural experiments um, that the landscape offers us. So when I look at uh, the Colorado Front Range, um, to make that, that picture a little clearer here, we look at this landscape. I'm standing here looking towards the west with the plains at my back. And what you see is the headwaters of this uh, landscape is, is one that has been shaped by glacial incision, glacial processes. Um, and uh, as you come down, you also see the, uh, the canyon, Boulder Creek, Boulder Canyon here. Uh, which has been cut by the river. It's a landscape that's influenced by fluvial incision, and you can see these very steep uh, bedrock-dominated walls here. And in between those two um, recently uh, uh, eroded, um, excited uh, parts of the landscape is another part of the landscape here that has not had these kinds of uh, excitations by, by erosion processes. Um, 
My uh, first goal then is to see what drives this, to understand what drives the, the canyon cutting part of this landscape. That's what I'm going to focus on uh, here in the next few slides. Here's what that LIDAR data looks like that we've uh, collected in uh, Boulder Creek. Um, so this is a, a very enviable data set. It's available on our website. I'll just put that plug in here. But looking at this topography, you can see the glacial troughs up in the headwaters that have been eroded. You can also see, uh, actually, that you can make out the, the deposits of the glaciers here. Uh, you can see the terrain that's not dissected, too. You can see this um, kind of flat, rolling, high terrain in the front range. And then you see the canyons down here uh, that have been carved. And you can also see terraces out on uh, the little bit of the plains that we have uh, imaged with the LIDAR. So you can see this is a particularly spectacular uh, alluvial mantled terrace out on the plains. So all these are um, components uh, of um, the topography that we seek to understand. Now, at the very longest um, time scale, we need to look at the geology of um, our, our setting. So here's the, the state of Colorado geologic map and Boulder Creek outlined on there, um, straddling the Colorado Front Range and uh, going out onto the plains. Now, the Colorado Front Range is um, a laramide origin. Uh, that laramide orogeny brought up crystalline rocks along a listric normal fault, like as is illustrated in this cross-section, um, and brings crystalline rocks up adjacent to the soft sedimentary rocks of the Cretaceous seaways. Um, since the laramide orogeny, uh, the plains have been uh, exhumed. I'll talk about that here. Um, and the question, and the canyons have been cut, and the question is, what has driven that exhumation uh, that marks the plains? Um, and when I show you a topographic cross-section across, across the, much of the country, you can see here that the Great Plains are this very large uh, feature, a very long topographic ramp. And the question is, what's driving the incision of the plains and, and also carving uh, the headwaters of the Front Range? Uh, is that a tectonic process, or is this uh, climatically driven? Uh, obviously, the welt itself is a tectonic feature, uh, but what drives that incision? Now, we know the plains have been exhumed uh, by looking at the geology. So this is a combination of a topographic map. You can see the topography on this, as well as a little bit of geology, this shaded uh, material out here is the famous Ogallala group uh, sediments. These are, are gravels that are uh, consist of crystalline rocks that have been shed from the Rockies. So they're crystalline sediments that were derived here in the Rockies and transported and deposited out here uh, on the plains. And the exhumation that I'm talking about is seen by the fact that 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 those sediments are missing in large areas between the sediment source here in the mountain front and uh, they're deposited out here on the plains. And in fact, the Ogallala Formation, uh, the top of that formation is uh, around five million years ago. And so that's the, the marker that we use to see this exhumation of the plains. Um, this is a paper that was uh, by uh, Cam Wobus, I'm going to talk about here for a few minutes, uh, examining the question of whether climate change, uh, basically sediment or water fluxes, or tectonics can explain uh, this exhumation. This has been a debate that's been raging uh, out there. So if you look at the plains, uh, at the topography, we've got a topographic swaths here uh, in a place where the Ogallala is still um, found all the way up to the mountain front. That's the blue lines on this cross section. And in a place where the Ogallala is absent along the mountain front. And you can see this big uh, bite out of um, the plains that's represented by that. And this has some characteristics, like, for instance, the, the uh, exhumation is greatest, is focused near the mountain front. It's, it's greatest here. And it tapers as you go out onto the plains. Um, so that's the, the signal that we're trying to understand. And if you look at 
uh, um, climate, uh, the climate uh, uh, during the time since the Ogallala deposition uh, ended, that time is indicated by the blue bars here, has undergone some changes. So climate is a, is a um, candidate for this exhumation because we know it's changed. For instance, this work um, looking at uh, C carbon-13 uh, isotopes um, on the plains and vegetation shows that the climate has been drying since the end of Ogallala deposition. If you look at the global climate as expressed in this Zakos uh, figure of um, uh, isotopes in marine sediments, you know that the climate has been cooling uh, globally since the end of Ogallala time. So those are the, the two uh, um, ways that climate has changed. And the question is, well, how do those kinds of changes uh, lead to um, changes in river systems? How might river systems might respond to that climate? So what uh, Wobus um, and co-authors did was build a, a model of a river system, a fairly simplified model with transport limited erosion, uh, bed load uh, transport uh, defined by meyer petter muller formula, just uh, excess shear stress. Um, I'm sorry about this blob on here. I don't know why they asked that, but um, they assume it's a, a wide uh, channel with steady uniform flow. And out of this, you can come up with an, um, a uh, non-dimensionalized everything. You can come up with a um, transport-limited erosion equation in which there are knobs that you can relate to tectonics and climate. So here's uplift, for instance. That's the tectonic signal. And uh, the rest of this basically boils down to knobs that have to do with water um, delivery to the system as well as sediment supply to the system. And then you can look at the erosion patterns that result from that. Again, I refer you to this uh, Cam Wobus paper if you want the details. But this is what their results look like. Uh, kind of a busy slide, so let me walk you through it. Um, the, in their model, uh, they're looking at the channel profile over time and turning those knobs for climate and for tectonics. So here's, for instance, in this corner, we're looking at uh, the profile initially uh, in steady state, and then they tweak the climate uh, here with changing the water delivery, being more water from the mountains and less from the plains, uh, as is indicated by this isotope records. And you see the, the profile evolve over time. The lower plot shows the um, pattern of incision uh, that's reflected from those profile evolution. So here's the, the water part. Here's the profiles that you get if you simply change the sediment load. And the, the experiment they ran was declining, decreasing the sediment load from the mountains. And you can see the, the change in um, the profile and, and the pattern of incision here that's um, recorded that uh, by that event. For tectonics, they did a, um, a tilting upward to the west, which has been um, inferred for, a, a, a used as an explanation for this pattern of uh, incision, uh, exhumation of the plains. And again, you can see the profile evolve, and you can see the pattern of incision. Now, what you see is that all of these produce a pattern of incision where the, the incision is greatest near the mountain front, which is on the left side of these profiles, and smaller out on the plains. But the focus is more, um, it's more focused in the, the two climate controls. Uh, it's more uniformly distributed incision in, with the tectonic control. Another difference that comes out of these uh, looking at the climate versus the tectonic controls here is that, and it's not evident from these, these figures, but uh, is that the um, incision propagates downstream with the climate controls and it propagates upstream with the tectonic controls. So the conclusion from this is that you can uh, drive the exhumation of the rivers, the downcutting of the rivers, the switch from depositing Ogallala sediments to exhuming them, to, to incising into them, with climate controls of changes in water delivery and changes in sediment, uh, equally as well as you could with tectonics. Now, if we look uh, at the um, record of exhumation on the plains, we're zooming in now and look at, the, at some of the alluvial terraces that are left on the plains. Here's a map of some of them around. Uh, here's where Boulder Creek comes out. 
Um, you can see these different elevation surfaces. They go from blue high down to the very close to the modern surfaces yellow. Um, these, uh, some of these terraces have been dated by Duneforth and Anderson uh, using cosmogenic radionuclides. And this is the, the conclusion that they draw, um, is that these uh, terraces record occupation of the terrace and deposition of sediments um, uh, and beveling of the terraces laterally during glacial climates. So that's this first conclusion here. And they get that from their cosmogenic radionuclide ages of those surfaces. And that those surfaces tend to be abandoned during very deep interglacials. They try to illustrate that here. It, this figure came out somewhat fuzzy, but let me try to walk you through it. The red line here is the benthic delta O18 record for marine sediments. So it's a, it's a climate proxy. Um, over the quaternary, so starting two million years ago here and coming towards the present. You can see all the glacial cycles. The bars here at the top, the black ones and the gray ones, those are ages that they have for sediments on some of these surfaces. The two black ones are both on the highest surface here, the rocky flats, and it looks like that surface was occupied continuously for a million years, um, by, bracketed by those two ages. And so the times that they don't, uh, that, that incision happens seems to be these very deep interglacials. And so this implies, again, that it's climate um, uh, parameters that control when the river can bite down into the plains uh, underneath. Now, th we've been talking about exhumation of the plains. Um, this is a longitudinal profile for Boulder Creek and many of its tributaries, and we've been looking out here on the plains and saying, what drives that exhumation? We're, I'm arguing that it's uh, likely a climate signal and that the climate signal that matters is sediment supply and water supply. Um, there's been uh, something like 500 meters of exhumation. Now, that sets the boundary condition for what happens in the, in the mountain front here, where we, now the river has to argue with crystalline rocks. And you can see that the river has nick points in it. This prominent nick point here is where that incision, that exhumation, has reached uh, at present. And you can see that that nick point, uh, there, are, there are nick points in all these tributaries as well. So let me uh, show you what that looks like um, back here in the topography. Here's that LIDAR topography. We can turn that into a slope map. And you can see in the slope map uh, the canyons have very steep red slopes here lining them. And here's that region of low relief in blues that the, the canyons are cutting into. Now I'm going to look at cross sections um, across the river at various points. Um, and this figure came out a little fuzzy, uh, but you can see uh, the difference between the very, um, I hope you can see, the very broad U-shaped valleys up in the, in the headwaters here, the glacial troughs, very highest cross sections. You come down and you get to that nick point, and it's a very narrow uh, V-shaped valley, just like we learned back in you know, Geology 101. And then as you go downstream from the nick point, uh, we, we maintain that V-shape as you come out here. Uh, but the slopes that get uh, lay back through time. So you can see how that incision has been propagating up and how it excites these hill slopes as it comes through and uh, the, the response of those hill slopes then um, to that, that event that happened to them uh, millions of years ago. So I've been arguing here that <clears throat> the fluvial exhumation um, uh, these rivers is controlled by water and sediment supply. Get my green arrow to move. The interesting thing about about the water and sediment supply controls is that these are affected by processes on hill slopes, particularly the sediment supply. So we now need to turn to what controls the sediment supply in order to understand uh, the landscape uh, evolution in these in these environments. And that, um, with that, I'll turn to hill slope, scope, hill slope scale uh, processes and the kinds of natural experiments we're looking at at this scale. 
um, I'm showing you a Google Earth image of uh, one of the catchments that we have a lot of uh, work going on in the Boulder Creek um, Critical Zone Observatory. This is the Gordon Gulch catchment. It's at about 2,500 meters in altitude. This is in that region that's relatively undissected, unaffected by the, the canyon cutting and not affected by the glaciers below the limit of the glaciers. And this also is the elevation that currently has, is on kind of the margins of areas that develop a seasonal winter snowpack. And when you look at this landscape, the stream is flowing here from uh, left to right. And you see that there are um, hill slopes that are north facing that look quite different from the hill slopes that are south facing. So this is um, an environment that we're going to take, an, a natural experiment that we're going to take advantage of um, that allows us to uh, look at the effects of, um, of slope aspect on hill slope processes and hydrology. So, here we see that the, the slope aspect uh, gives very different um, energy balance um, and, and different radiation climates on these hill slopes. This is a model here showing the radiation on the south facing slopes with the red bars and the blue um, bars show the radiation on the north facing slope. And it's, it's, it's quite dramatic, um, as you'd expect, with the north and south facing slope. This is also uh, seen in differences in the vegetation on these slopes. The south facing slopes tend to be dominated by um, ponderosa pine, but it's an open woodland, so there's a lot of uh, uh, sub uh, vegetation in the understory as well, whereas the north facing slopes are a very dense lodgepole forest and, and not much uh, understory there. And what we find is that there's a, a difference in hydrologic response on these two hill slopes. The <coughs> hill slope aspect also controls the snowpack, and what I'm showing you here is the uh, data from a snow survey that was conducted. Uh, at the beginning of the, the big snowmelt season in 2008. The green uh, points here, contours here, are basically zeros, uh, no snow, and those are found on the south-facing slopes, whereas the, the pinks and, and white colors here are um, large values, getting up to a maximum of about a meter depth. So there's a big contrast between a snowpack that develops on the north-facing slopes and uh, a lack of snowpack, a uh, persistent snowpack, on the south-facing slopes. And this is not just because we missed it on the south-facing slope. It, it really does come and go on these slopes. Now, I'm going to show you uh, data from an experiment that was conducted down here in the lower part of Gordon Gulch, which we didn't get to in our snow survey in 2008, but it has similar uh, snowpack dynamics. Um, and we're trying to understand uh, how these differences in, in uh, snowpack and energy balance affect water flow paths on those hill slopes. Now we can see a difference um, if we look at soil moisture on these slopes. So on the top plot here, I'm showing uh, two different soil moisture sensors on a north-facing slope. The trace is here over a, a period of about a year, starting in the fall. Um, starting in September here and running through July. And on the bottom, I'm showing similar data for a south-facing site just across the valley. Um, I've illustrated on here as well uh, um, soil temperatures just during the period, just to illustrate when they're frozen. So I'm only showing temperatures going below zero. You can see my temperature scale here goes is just negative. Didn't want to show you all the stuff where it gets positive. Uh, so you can see that the north-facing slope tends to be frozen for a longer period of time than the south-facing slope, which only has a brief and not very deep freeze event. And the north-facing slope tends to stay, is, is dry in the winter. Finally, that snowpack begins to melt, and we see the spring snow melt in a nice sustained wet period uh, at the end of that. Whereas the south-facing slope is... Um, relatively dry while it's frozen, but then it starts to, to, to thaw out the, and snow melt events happen repeatedly in the spring. I mean, this is starting in beginning of March 
uh, and the snow comes and goes. So it's quite different in terms of soil moisture from one slope to the other. Note also this, these very brief uh, snowfall events in the fall. Uh, these are in October and early November uh, that have different responses on these two hill slopes. The snow basically completely melts on the south facing slope. Okay, so we've uh, actually conducted a real experiment, uh, not just a natural experiment, on uh, in this setting. And this is work of um, Eve Hinckley, who uh, decided to, to do a tracer experiment. She applied a lithium bromide solution to five different plots. Um, and what I'm showing you here are two of her plots on the day that we applied the tracer. This was her snow melt tracer experiment. Uh, we conducted that on the 10th of April, applied the tracer on the 10th of April, um, and the south-facing sites were didn't have snow. There was no snowpack, whereas the north-facing sites did have snow. Uh, we did remove the snow, put the tracer down, and then shoveled the snow back on. So we did disturb the snow to do this. And this is what uh, a, a brief summary of, of um, one of her key findings from that experiment. Um, this shows, uh, plot is showing time series of melt on the top here, on the north facing slope, and melt on the south facing slope, and then her, her tracer uh, results in the lower plot here. So the tracer was applied on April 10th. The uh, north facing um, site was, was melting. Um, the snowpack that was existing there was melting, and that shows up in uh, the appearance of the tracer. I'm just showing at one depth, but on three different plots here, um, very rapidly um, on those north-facing sites or plots with snowpack on them. Um, the tracer uh, flushed through very rapidly and then was, was gone for the remaining month over which she sampled. Whereas that south-facing site, uh, the tracer had to uh, wait for there to be snow. The snow was gone, absent at the time the tracer was applied. It had to wait for another snowfall event and, uh, and melt of that snowfall, and then we started seeing the tracer appear there. Um, so these are the plots without snowpack uh, in green. <clears throat> and notice that in these plots, um, there was tracer retained within the soil throughout the, the measurement period. This one this one peak here is the only one where the tracer was washed out out of four um, different measurement sites on the south facing slope. All the rest retained tracer for the duration of the experiment. So uh, the, the summary here is that the south facing sites had, um, they actually had more snow melt in total uh, because they don't have that canopy interfering uh, with the snowfall. So they actually had more water flux in total but it was an intermittent flow, uh, and tracer remained. And out of that, we infer that it was a preferential flow system. But there was also an important immobile um, part of the water that was relatively immobile within the matrix, which contrasts with the north-facing site that had um, less snow, but had once the snow melt begins, it's continuous flow. Uh, the tracer was completely flushed out, and we infer that that's a matrix flow or piston flow um, type of flow system. So we have these two very different hydrologic systems uh, from one um, hill slope to the other because of the difference in um, surface energy balance and snow delivery. Uh, just a, a, a note here is that Eve, um, in addition to doing this lithium bromide tracer study, also applied N15 and looked at nitrogen dynamics. The data from that uh, fits very well with this uh, picture of the two different flow systems. She sees that playing out in the um, ecosystem and nitrogen dynamics on these hill slopes. So stay tuned for um, her presentations on that to come. Now, that hill slope uh, um, study seems also to have um, impacts elsewhere. And what I want to share with now are some things that we are um, actively pursuing and working on um, and uh, not, com not complete at this point. So here's, here's data showing the impacts of different flow paths on stream chemistry in Gordon Gulch. And uh, remember I showed you the uh, soil moisture over a year. Here's that soil moisture uh, time trace starting again in um, uh, 
basically August and running through uh, for a year. So you see the fall uh, snow events and melt, uh, the soil moisture associated with those, the time it was frozen, and then the many snow melt events um, and, and summer rainfall events as well on the south facing slope. Well now the, the black dots here are showing the um, stream chemistry in Gordon Gulch at the base of that hill slope. Um, and this is the, the chloride concentration in the stream. And what's, what really caught my eye here is that the chloride uh, seems to respond to these times of there being snow melt occurring on the south facing slope. So those slopes that have this very um, flashy preferential flow somehow are mobilizing chloride. Notice I've got precipitation chloride uh, chemistry plotted on here as well from an NADP site. Uh, it's not uh, precipitation events that are salty. It's some other source. I'm working actively on what that is. So here's an interesting connection between these different flow paths um, and the, the whole catchment response. Notice, too, that the summer events here in July, uh, summer rainstorm events, do not have that chloride response. It's something about the snowmelt events that do. Now that's one year worth of data, but we have several years worth of data here. Uh, so here's three different years um, compiled. We've just been looking at the, the year that's shown in black. Uh, I, unfortunately, I've, now I'm going from January to December. So here's that uh, fall um, chloride event. Um, but you can see uh, that these kinds of patterns are seen in each of the years that we have had. In the fall, we tend to have a, a chloride peak, and both of these, the 2009 and 2010, are associated with late October uh, snowstorms. Uh, there's also um, uh, high chloride during the time of snow melt in the spring. Now, I just want to point out that the blue dots here are the 2011 data. We just had a snowstorm on Wednesday. I'm eager to run out and, uh, and, and see if I can track down um, the, the source of this high chloride that I'm sure is in, there in the stream right now. So that's something that we're actively trying to understand. Now another thing, uh, when we look in Gordon Gulch in the subsurface, we see that there are big differences in the depth of weathering um, from one aspect uh, slope to another. Um, I seem to have lost, oh, there's my pointer. Um, this uh, plot is showing um, results from shallow seismic refraction uh, transects that we've run in Gordon Gulch. Uh, the blue, dark blue colors here are uh, high velocities, um, which are inferred to be crystalline rock, intact fresh rock, in other words, and the, and the warm colors are low uh, velocities. Uh, seismic velocities, which are the uh, relatively um, weathered and disaggregated materials. And the thing that I take out of this figure is that the north-facing slopes in, the, on, in these transects all show greater depth to um, fresh rock than do the south-facing slopes. So this difference in, in moisture that we're seeing from one slope to the other integrated over time seems to be uh, affiliated with a difference in the depth of weathering on one slope versus the other. So we would like to understand the processes that drive that. And here we're working, we're using uh, models uh, to try and, and look at this. And we're starting to think of weathering as really a, a damage process, that rock is damaged um, by uh, chemical processes as well as mechanical processes over time, um, and that changes the strength of the rock and the seismic velocities and everything else, its susceptibility to being entrained and eroded. Um, one of the ways we're looking at that damage is by measuring rock strength. Here's a, uh, we're testing a sample in a um, uh, instrument in the um, geophysics lab. Um, and, and the figure here is one of our attempts to, to get at the understanding the process and modeling the process by thinking about the impacts of frost cracking, which we think is an important um, process here over the time scales over which these weathered profiles develop over the quaternary. Um, we can model frost cracking because it's driven largely by temperature, which is what you see here. This is a temperature profile or many temperature profiles over the course of a year. Um, 
and we can model uh, frost cracking by tracking when is rock in the temperature window, the frost cracking window, uh, which is most likely to, to break by frost processes. Um, I'm going to show you not the details of the model, but a, a model output here for such a model. This is one in which we're looking at um, uh, the weathering front over a whole um, landscape, a cross-section of a landscape where we have weathering processes driven by frost. We also have uh, sediment transport on the hill slopes driven by frost creep, and we also uh, release rock from the rock into the soil to be creep down slope at a rate that is modulated by uh, the degree of weathering of that rock before it, it gets to the surface. And this is the result of a model run, which we started with an equilibrium uh, situation outlined by the dashed line here, and then increased the incision rate uh, of the channels at the base of the hill slopes and watched the hill slopes and the, the weathered rock try to keep up with that, and basically it can't. The rivers cut down rapidly, and the thickness of the weathered profile um, is, is uh, thinned by that process, whereas in the center of this, at the divide on this, in this model, uh, the weathered thickness, weathered profile thickness remains uh, greater. So we're pursuing models of this sort to try and understand how these weathering processes interact with um, sediment transport, channel evolution, and get at the architecture of the critical zone um, as driven by, by all of these processes. So um, environmental gradients um, uh, such as the ones that we find here in Gordon Gulch provide key insights for us into these critical zone processes. Um, I've uh, tried to show you that we, we have measured um, uh, differences in water flow paths in the subsurface, um, depending on differences in water delivery. Uh, we've measured that um, at the hill slope scale. Uh, we see the impacts of that at the watershed scale by looking at the stream chemistry uh, in, in the watershed. That differences in weathering, um, presumably tied with the water as well as uh, energy balance difference from one slope to the other, um, varies with slope aspect. And the kind of process understanding that we're get, getting by looking at these uh, different environments within one catchment uh, helps inform the types of landscape evolution models we need to understand uh, the, the critical zone as a whole. Now, as I um, come to a close here, I, I wanted to um, invite all of you to, to uh, think of these critical zone observatories as um, the community resource that they're meant to be. So I wanted to provide you with a little insight into what kind of um, uh, resources we offer. Within uh, the Boulder Creek watershed, here's a, a map of the whole watershed, we have three catchments in which we've done a lot of uh, focus work, ranging from the uh, Green Lakes Valley, this one, uh, in the Alpine, to Gordon Gulch, which we've been looking at here in the um, uh, low relief terrain to uh, the Tasso, which is a small watershed down here um, below uh, the the Nick zone in Boulder Creek, so one where that fluvial incision has been going on at its base. And you can see each of these dots is a place where we either have an instrument or a, a, a sampling site that we visit. I should mention that uh, Green Lakes Valley we also um, share with the NIWAT LTER, and so they have uh, actually quite a bit more infrastructure. These are just the things we've added to what they already have. Um, here's a list of uh, what uh, kinds of instruments and monitoring we are doing. We continue to add to um, that list. That we've still got installations we're going to try and get in, even with the snow out there uh, right now knowing it will melt soon. Um, and so all of these things are, are available, um, and we truly welcome outside investigators uh, and, and really do want to be that community resource. Um, the data that we're collecting, uh, we're posting on our, in our website, um, and, and so there's, there's data sets that are available as well. 
uh, and the place to find those data sets, you can look on these, these websites, um, czo.colorado.edu uh, is, is the local website, and criticalzone.org is the national website. They're all linked together, and you can link to the other CZOs there as well. And so with that, I um, thank you for your attention, and I'm, I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much for doing this, Suzanne. That was a great talk. I'm hoping that people have questions. If not, I have a long list here. <laughs> well, to get things started, I, I, my question was, you know, having been back there and seen the effects of fire up uh, in those hills behind Denver, I mean, those right. very much altered the landscape. Would you comment on how that might affect things? Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, we we actually had um, a fire uh, just over a year ago that burned a couple thousand hectares of Boulder Creek watershed, um, and and it's um, clear that that's an important impact on on these these landscapes. Um, I don't have an answer as to exactly how they they impact the landscape. I can tell you that there are um, uh, perturbations to hydrology and fluxes of sediment that are associated uh, with fire, um, and so they they have to they have to go into understanding this this whole um, uh, process. We have a, a student right now who is looking at um, uh, understanding. Uh, Floods and the fire situation would um, would be part of of the flood scenario um, for these these catchments. We're also looking at nutrient fluxes uh, associated with the fire. But it's certainly one of those important processes, and it's it's a natural experiment, uh, so to speak, that's going on out there in our in our catchment right now. I guess to follow up on that, in terms of the chloride response, do you think that those might be contributing ash that would, you know, perhaps build up over time and then inject or maybe dry deposition sources for the chloride? You know, I I um, I've got to figure out what where this chloride is coming from, uh, and those are great ideas. Um, what it might be, I I kind of doubt that it's ash because although you can see. Um, you can find charcoal in in the soils, um, bits of charcoal here and there. I, I don't I don't think it's enough to um, be this you know repeated every year uh, little flush of chloride that we see. There is some hydrothermal alteration in parts of this of the catchment, and that may be maybe there are minerals that contain chloride. Um, Perhaps dry deposition, although I would think that would show up in the NADP um, uh, samples and in the uh, the snows the snow chemistry, and I haven't seen it in our snow chemistry that we've analyzed. Um, we did collect this most recent snow. I made sure <laughs> that my field staff was out there on Thursday morning getting the snow um, so that we can analyze its yeah. its chemistry. Uh, in terms of soil tension, I noticed you had some soil tension listed on your equipment list. Is there, are there any measurements that suggest saturation in the subsurface? Um, we don't have enough um, matrix potential measurements, but uh, no, we don't. Those they do not come up to saturation. The places we've measured it, um, this is a, a you know a pretty dry uh, um, setting, as you know. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I honestly don't know the depth to the water table in very many places. Uh, in the places I do know it, it's, it's um, on the hill slopes, it's uh, ordered 10 meters down and, and, and um, along riparian areas, of course, it's much closer to the surface. Um, but I don't see saturation developing in the places that we've measured it in the soil. Uh, folks, I'm going to keep asking questions until somebody else jumps in here. So if you get tired of me, please join in here. And uh, I guess Conrad is sending you can unmute your phone using the star six command or simply type in the chat box or raise your hand if you're interested. 
I had a question then on the um, the extreme events. I mean, the, your Wobus model sort of was an average kind of flow condition. Do you think something like a rain on snow event, um, some kind of large uh, snowpack followed by a, a heavy warm rain might cause some catastrophic incision? Well, the, the Wobus model isn't trying to um – capture particular events, uh, so I, it, you would have to fold those kinds of events into um, into that incision. You know, you're trying to look at it over over long periods of time, so you can't don't have that kind of temporal resolution. But that's a good question, and certainly the um, the modeling or the measurements that show that it's interglacial times where uh, the um, channel is is down cutting points to events of that scale, not not the rain on snow event, but the event of having uh, a, a cutoff in sediment supply um, being really important in the long term evolution of this landscape. If you remember, it's I mean one thing one question is um, how much sediment is in motion in the river, and, and another is well, when is it actually cutting doing the the work on the bed of the channel which is a bedrock incision uh and they're not they're not exactly the same question um and that's that's the what the wobus model is trying to get after and what the um the crn uh dates on the terraces tell us about and tim asked a question are there rainfall runoff event data available or are sampling times coarser than event based um, we have um, we have put in stream gauges in uh, our subcatchments, so those would have runoff uh, uh, data. Uh, the rainfall data um, we're collecting uh, at a couple locations, and then um, at, at Batasso, for instance, we have a Met Tower. Uh, we're putting in Met Towers in in uh, Gordon Gulch, and then when you get up to Niwot Ridge. Um, it, it's not things that we've put in, but there are plenty of um, uh, climate stations actually that have been ex in existence uh, on um, Niwot Ridge since 1950. Um, so yes, there are um, there are rainfall runoff kinds of data. There's also USGS gauges on Boulder Creek, and we haven't tried to you know we, we rely on those USGS gauges. But I really want to ask. Uh, Ying Fan Reinfelder has a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Says this is very interesting. We need to know more about weathering depths and patterns. Do you actually see that the soil is deeper on hilltops, as the model says, in active channel downcutting regions? You're absolutely correct that we need we need to know more about weathering depths um, in uh, in our Potasso catchment, which is the one uh, that is trying to capture that uh, location where uh, the river has been down cutting uh, um, and and the the top of the catchment is is trying to catch up with it in other words looking at the effects of fluvial um, incision um, we see exactly that pattern at the at the top of that catchment is a very deep um, beautiful saprolite and at the bottom of the catchment there's um, there's outcrops everywhere. Um, it's I haven't yet tried to come up with a good way to to quantify that, other than at points. Um, and so I'm I'm interested in having ways to look at it with more resolution. Our shallow seismic data is we actually had a hard time collecting it um, down at the uh, uh, right in the canyon. I mean you've got canyon walls. It's you can't. You can't go out there with your hammer seismic. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's too steep. See, it looks like there was another question. I'm just starting to read these uh, typing questions. Type faster. <laughs> Can you see the Joel Moore question? How does oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. 
<clears throat> How's mass balance work out for the chloride? I have not done a mass balance yet on the chloride. Um, great question. I, I, I haven't yet integrated the, the chloride concentration data, which is what I showed you, with uh, discharge to get at flux, which is what I need. Um, and I, I, evapotranspiration is sort of my the, the thing I turn to and say, well, it must be evapotranspiration, but it's it's too much. It's about a factor of ten change in the concentration uh, between what we what's been measured in precipitation and what's coming out in the in the channel, and that just seems a little too high. Um, but it may have to do with these uh, frost dynamics um, uh, concentrating um, the chloride. I, I, I presented that as this is an intriguing bit that we're, we're looking at and thinking about, but we have not sorted it all out. Definitely intriguing, yes. And please feel free to ask directly. Unmute your phone and, and simply ask a question at this point. Well, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank Suzanne so much for, for doing this. Uh, looks like Joel Moore has, okay, he's just thanking <laughs> Suzanne. So, thank you, uh, Joel. <laughs> and I hope to see everybody again next week. Uh, we're going to have a long series of these speaking speakers summarizing their work. So this is a great opportunity to learn more about this program. Uh, John, I'm not going to butcher the last name, Chorover. Chor Chorover. Uh, the Jemez, I believe, are in New Mexico. The Catalinas are just outside of Tucson. So I think that's a great parallel system to what you're studying up in Boulder Creek. Well, yeah, my thanks, Suzanne, for doing this. I think this is a great way of trying to reach out to the community. And just as you said, these are funded as a community resource. So I hope we get some good interactions going. Wonderful. We, we would welcome it. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.